was perfectly natural that we begin this Lenten season, hopefully with a lot of fervor, hopefully with a lot of hope, a lot of expectation, kind of like we begin a new year. We're four days into Lent. How's the journey going so far? Hopefully better than the first four days of January went for most of us. So four days into this experience, this opportunity to delve deeper into our relationship with God, deeper into how He's calling us to be discipled by Him. And so it's perfect then that we have the readings that we have this weekend. Our first reading where we hear of the fall of man. We hear, once and for all, it was Eve's fault, right? Men, don't we agree it's always the woman's fault? Notice not one man shook their head. Smart. They're learning. But that's not what the first reading said from Genesis. What the first reading did say, as we read through it, was that many times when we don't know for certain certain things, we begin to doubt ourselves. Notice when the snake or the serpent encounters Eve for the first time. What does he say to her? What can you eat from? Why can't you eat from this tree? Well, the Lord said we can't even eat or even look at this tree lest we die. That's not what the Lord said. The Lord said, you shall not eat from this tree. Not that you shouldn't look at it, but that you shouldn't eat it. But you know sometimes where you get called out, where we begin to second guess ourselves? We're like, oh, what did they actually say? Oh my goodness, I want to make sure I said the right things here, because if not, I may fall up in trouble. And we end up embellishing the truth sometimes, right? When we're in doubt, we don't know exactly where to find our surety. And so, that's one of the greatest gifts that Satan uses. He uses our doubt against us. Because then he goes a step further and says, surely you will not die. If you just eat this little itty bitty fruit, it won't be that bad. And so she begins to believe and she begins to conform to this untruth because she doesn't know what's true and what's not true. But how many times do we fall into that same trap ourselves? And then when we fall into that trap, do we fall into peer pressure along with it? The sin of Adam where she said, well, I fell into this, and hey, come eat of this. Again, not her fault for sin. Notice not once in Scripture is Eve blamed for the sin. It's the sin of Adam, because he knowingly went into it. He didn't have that doubt. He had that surety, and he knew what he was doing. How many times do we think we know we're doing what is right for the right reason, Yet we fall into sin. We fall into despair. Then we have our second reading from St. Paul to the Romans. Anybody else confused in the middle of that reading? It's one of the most theologically logical arguments that St. Paul ever makes. Basically what he was saying, to kind of dumb it down for us, because I had to look at it multiple times and say, okay, Paul, what are you trying to tell us here? Since through one man sin entered into the world, Adam and the sin of Adam, Through one man, sin had to be taken out of the world. Jesus. Second reading. That's it. Since sin entered through one man, and we all have to pay the price of it, because of one man, we are all redeemed if we accept that gift. Ultimately, it's repeated two or three different times in that second reading. And then we get to our gospel, where Satan tries the same trick that he used on Eve— on the new Adam, Jesus. Did you notice how he questioned him after the 40 days and nights in the desert? If you are the Son of God, he's trying to sow doubt. Notice that? He's not trying to say, you are the Son of God. No, if you are the Son of God, it's a doubtful question working that in, and he does it for the first two questions. If you are the Son of God, turn this stone into bread. Because after 40 days and 40 nights, he's hungry. That's how we start that gospel. I think most of us, after four days and four nights, after four hours, most of us are pretty hungry, right? 40 days and 40 nights fasting in the desert, he's pretty parched. He must have been thirsty. 
I mean, th- think about being outside for four days out here in the dryness, how cracked your lips would be, how much your face would be peeling, be like, water! I need water! Yet, he didn't fall to the trap of doubt. He didn't fall into that old sleuth foot's trap. But how many times do we unknowingly and unwittingly fall into that same trap that he's been sitting since the beginning of time? Doubt in itself is not a sin, but doubt can lead us into very sinful behaviors. How many times have people tried to argue with us from the position of doubt? Prove to me that God exists. If you can prove to me God exists, I'll change my point of view. No, you won't. I just want you to realize that you can't prove it, therefore you're going to begin to doubt it, and therefore you're going to stop believing it. What does that do except for make us a much more miserable world? How many times do we allow doubt in our lives, doubt in our faith, doubt in our spouse, doubt in our vocation, doubt in our job, doubt in our success to lead us astray. Oh, Father, I have been married to my spouse for 5, 10, 15, 20, 55 years, and man, it gets harder and harder each day. I said, yes, welcome to marriage. That's how it works. And remember 55, 40, and 30, and 20, and 15, and 5 years ago, you said, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. In good times, And in bad times. I will love you and honor you all the days of my life. It's easy for us to love when we are being reciprocated with that love. It's hard when we're doubting ourselves. It's hard when we're doubting the person that God has put into our lives who we have seen as our spouse, we have called our spouse, we have said, I do to. That's when it becomes really, really hard in life because that's when Satan starts to bring in doubt. In fact, I can't tell you how many people, because I can't remember, since I've been ordained as a priest, I've had come to me both in confession and outside of confession and say, Father, I've been married for X amount of years, but there's this new person in my life. Do you think God may be calling me to be in a relationship with them? Now that sounds crazy, right? When we look at it logically, it's like, no, of course not. But I mean, they're listening to me and they're answering everything that I want. They're giving me what it is that I need. No. They're filling that void that is left by your spouse many times because they aren't giving you what you want. And so many times we look in places that are comfortable to find those things. This is where affairs come from. Not just physical, but emotional affairs. That if we aren't talking to each other, if we aren't lifting each other up, if we aren't building each other up, doubt begins to seep in because that is Satan's most powerful arsenal against us. We see it in the beginning. We see it that that's the first and second thing that he tried against Christ as well. So what makes us think he's not going to try and make us doubt ourselves as well? It's said that within the first 10 years, if a priest is going to leave the priesthood, that's when it's going to happen. Because the first three to five years are typically the honeymoon phase. I had a year as an associate. Typically, the honeymoon phase is supposed to be your whole associate. And it's like 365 days. That's not long enough. Many of you guys go on like second and third and fourth and fifth honeymoon 20 years in. I got a year. So does that mean I have to be sure about these things? Like seven and a half years in and eight and a half years in? Well, I said I do seven and a half years ago. So if I didn't know then, how is this doubt that I have in my life now going to make me more sure? The same way that you in your marriage, though you may have doubt about your spouse, that you may have doubted, man, we were just two dumb kids and we didn't know any better. You may not have known any better, but... What have you learned about each other since? The sacrament of marriage, just like the sacrament of holy orders, begins at the I do, begins at the yes, and we grow and nurture each other together throughout that relationship. 
Oh, but Father, life was so much easier before they came. It's like, before who came? You know, Father, them. I, I don't know. You've got to tell me. Them. Before the kids came, life was so much easier, Father. I said, well, welcome to marriage. Remember that whole be fruitful and multiply part? That means you guys. That you as parents are called to be not just husband and wife, but good mothers and fathers. Oh, but Father, my models of faith were not good. Jesus wasn't good? No, no, no. My parents, they weren't good. But aren't there other models out there? Well, I guess. Well, look to them. How many times do we look outside of our immediate family for validation except for the places where it really matters? If you had a dad that was horrible, if you had a mom that was horrible, first of all, pray for them. Second of all, you're still called to love them. Third of all, learn from their mistakes and vow to do better. One of the things that I've learned as a priest, we're all different. Every priest is different. Praise God there's not a second Father Danny. Thank you. I don't say that to build up my ego. I don't think the world could deal with a second Father Danny. Because this is enough to just, we're all, we're all up, up a creek. I don't know where I was going with that. But, <laughs> but many times in life, all we do is focus on the negative. All we do is focus on where Satan has put that doubt in our lives. And we don't see the positive. That's one of the reasons that the church gives us seasons like Advent, seasons like Lent. So that we can take that retreat from our daily life and take a step back and say, where is the goodness in my life? If you haven't been on a date with your spouse in a while, permission. Go on a date this week. Oh, but Father, we are busy. I don't care. Go on a date with your spouse sometime in the next 10 days. That is your homework. Oh, but Father, I mean, we travel a lot. You can't plan one day in ten? Oh, but it's going to be difficult. Good. Because anything worth doing many times is difficult. And your marriage is going to be difficult, especially if you aren't intentional in it. I promise you this was not meant to be a marriage homily, but it just turned into that. Because for many of us in our lives... Our initial vocation of holiness is not where we focus. We focus in our vocation of life, whether it be marriage, holy life, that say your religious life, single life. That's where our main focus is. Then use this time to focus on it. When was the last time you sat down with your spouse for an hour and just talked? I'll give you time. Not during the homily, don't worry. But when was the last time you just sat there and listened to each other and talked to each other? And not just the, how's your day? How's your day? Okay, moving on. No. You talked about your hopes. You talked about your fears. You talked about your dreams. Oh, but Father, we're in our 80s. We don't have any more dreams. You're still alive. Shoot for something and not each other <laughs> or at each other. <laughs> And that's the shots of love. Cross the bow. But when was the last time that we stopped doubting what God has given to us and had that surety of faith that by God, I am exactly where I need to be? I know I say this a lot, and I don't think you guys believe me. I am here for a reason. For me, as much as for you. That as I've been reflecting over these last two years, I look back and say, first of all, where did the time go? I feel like I just got here like two days ago. But then look back at all the things we've done in the last two years. And look forward to the things we're going to do in the next 20, or however long that I'm here, probably won't be here for 20 years, so let's be realistic, next 10. 
But it was great being with the men's conference this morning and talking to some of the people there and realizing that, yeah, it's two hours away, but this is home. This is where I find my hope. You guys bring it to me. I get teary. You guys bring it to me. In your lives, in your faithfulness, you keep showing up. That if you are doubting anything in your life, take it to the Lord and allow Him to be your surety. If you're struggling in doubt, maybe this is an opportunity to put your trust in God. There's no maybe there. This is your opportunity. One of the things I have in my wall, right below my clock, which is always off time, but right below my clock, is the image of the divine mercy. Because of what it says on the bottom. Jesus, I trust in you. That's one of my biggest struggles as a person, let alone as a priest. I struggle to put my faith in God sometimes. Because I am a control freak. Welcome to being a man. We are all control freaks. And so my role as a person is to let go and let God. That's terrifying sometimes. When we don't have control, we're out of control. But do you see sometimes the best things that happen are when we aren't in control? Ask Katie or Amy, I'm always stressed about something. I'm always anxious. Katie's like, yep. <laughs> and a lot of it's because I'm trying to control what's going on that's so much out of my control. Because I struggle with doubt. Because I struggle with fear. Because Satan's attacking me the same way that he's attacking you, the same way that he attacked Jesus, the same way that he attacked Adam and Eve in the garden. But you know what? I got to go to confession this morning and have my sins forgiven. I know I'm not worthy of it. <laughs> but I drove two hours to the city at 540 this morning. God wasn't even up yet. I had to wake him up to wake me up. To hear 20 men's confessions. To get back on the road. Skip my afternoon nap. You don't understand how important that is. Katie's like, you did what? I got 15 minutes, don't worry. I'm still technically alive. To then come here and hear more confessions. Because that's what brings me hope. Giving God's grace. That's what the sacraments are about. Putting fear and doubt in the past and giving us the surety that can only come from God. So four days into Lent, how are you doing? If you're not doing great, guess what? Tomorrow's day five. It's a new day, a new opportunity. Keep going.